Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for April 19th through 25th, 2021. This is covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 41 through 44. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Hello, scriptures. Wow, are we going to need you today? And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 30 minutes, 14 seconds. That's a great week's reading. What will it break down to daily? 4 minutes, 19 seconds. Fantastic. And we've got some time codes here if you want to study with us section by section. And now let's jump into a quick recap of where we are so far. In our lesson today, we are in 1831. And the church has had its third general conference on January 2nd, 1831, in Fayette, New York. The saints, if you'll recall from last lesson, have been commanded to gather in the Ohio. Right. So let's jump into DNC 41. There are going to be a couple of new characters introduced in this section, Newell K. Whitney and his wife Anne as well as Lehman Copley. And we'll find out a lot more about Lehman Copley a few lessons from now when we cover sections 49 through 50. The Institute Manual gives us a good summary of what's going on, though. It says, Joseph and Emma Smith left New York with Sidney Rigdon and Edward Partridge to go to Kirtland, Ohio. When they arrived in Kirtland in early February 1831, Joseph stopped at the Newell K. Whitney store. Newell Whitney and his wife, Anne, were recent converts to the church, but they had not yet met the prophet. Joseph entered the store, reached his hand across the counter, and said, Newell K. Whitney, thou art the man. When Newell expressed that he was at a disadvantage because he did not know to whom he was speaking, the prophet replied, I am Joseph, the prophet. You have prayed me here. Now what do you want of me? You know, I just love that introduction. That's always been one of my favorites. Look at what it teaches you about God's relationship with people. He knows you. He hears your prayers. He has servants that are prepared to listen and help. But, I mean, what an introduction. Newell K. Whitney, thou art the man. What does that say? That's (laughs) amazing. You're the man. Yeah, (laughs) love it. All right, back to the quote. Emma Smith was expecting twins within a couple of months, and the Whitneys invited Joseph and Emma to stay with them in their home. Now, remember, they left their home in Pennsylvania. Why did they leave? The Lord commanded them to move to the Ohio, right? And so they're following that commandment. But they've left. They don't have anywhere to stay. Yeah. Back to the summary. Still, Joseph and Emma needed a more permanent place to live as did Sidney and Phoebe Rigdon. With their conversion to the church, the Rigdons had given up the opportunity to live in a home being built for them by Sidney's former congregation when he was a minister in Mentor, Ohio. Lehman Copley, who had a large farm in Thompson, Ohio, about 20 miles east of Kirtland, offered to provide houses and supplies to Joseph and Sidney. Joseph prayed and received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 41. And this was on the very day that they arrived in Kirtland. Now, Stephen C. Harper, in his Book of Mormon Central Commentary, offers this insight. He says, Section 41 is strikingly countercultural. It highlights the differences between the kingdom of God and the world in which Joseph Smith lived. The revelation is neither democratic nor republican. It assumes that the Lord, not the people, are sovereign. It does not separate legislative, judicial, and executive powers. The Lord exercises them all. He assumes both the power and prerogative to bless and curse, to include and to cast out, to make and declare law, and to bring lawbreakers to judgment. He repeatedly refers to my law and calls for an assembly not to debate and create law, but to agree upon law dictated by revelation. Moreover, he commands specific action, most notably for Edward Partridge, to leave his merchandise and spend his whole effort executing the divine law. 
Section 41 is a revelation from a king with instructions about how to build his kingdom. So let's look at some of those instructions, starting in verse 2. Hearken, O ye elders of my church whom I have called. Behold, I give unto you a commandment, that ye shall assemble yourselves together to agree upon my word. And by the prayer of your faith ye shall receive my law, that ye may know how to govern my church, and have all things right before me. And I will be your ruler when I come. And behold, I come quickly, and ye shall see that my law is kept. He that receiveth my law and doeth it, the same is my disciple. And he that saith he receiveth it and doeth it not, the same is not my disciple, and shall be cast out from among you. So in verse 3, what law? What is he talking about? Do you remember when we studied Doctrine and Covenants 38? In verse 32, Wherefore, for this cause I gave unto you the commandment that you should go to the Ohio, and there I will give unto you my law. Nice. So the law is coming, yep. right? And we've been told that it's coming. Yep, that's exciting. I love that in verse 5 he emphasizes the importance of not only receiving the law, but doing it. That is the person who is the disciple. From the Institute Manual, I got a quote from then-President Dieter F. Uchtdorf from April 2009 General Conference. He says, quote, It is not enough merely to speak of Jesus Christ or proclaim that we are his disciples. It is not enough to surround ourselves with symbols of our religion. Discipleship is not a spectator sport. We cannot expect to experience the blessings of faith by standing inactive on the sidelines any more than we can experience the benefits of health by sitting on a sofa watching sporting events on television and giving advice to the athletes. Aww. And yet, for some, spectator discipleship is a preferred, if not a primary, way of worshiping. Ours is not a secondhand religion. We cannot receive the blessings of the gospel merely by observing the good that others do. We need to get off the sidelines and practice what we preach. Mm. End quote. Amen. Okay, coach. <laughs> That's wonderful. Let's take a look at verse 7. And this is addressing one of the issues, which is where Joseph and Sidney are going to live. And again, it is meet that my servant Joseph Smith Jr. should have a house built in which to live and translate. And again, it is meet that my servant Sidney Rigdon should live as seemeth him good, inasmuch as he keepeth my commandments. Now, there's some additional background provided by the Institute Manual, which says Joseph and Emma stayed with the Whitneys for only a few weeks, and then they relocated to the home of Isaac Morley, while the Saints built a small frame home for them on the Morley farm. Let's go back to the section starting in verse 9. And again, I have called my servant Edward Partridge, and I give a commandment that he should be appointed by the voice of the church and ordained a bishop unto the church to leave his merchandise and spend all his time in the labors of the church, to see to all things as it shall be appointed unto him in my laws in the day that I shall give them. And this because his heart is pure before me, for he is like unto Nathanael of old, in whom there is no guile. There are some amazing descriptions of Edward Partridge from both the Lord and Joseph Smith and others. He was a great man, and here he has been given an amazing assignment. But let's remember, Edward Partridge was baptized by Joseph Smith on December 11th, 1830. So this was like two months ago. Yeah. And I want to remind you, he was baptized in December. Uh-huh. So... <laughs> that can't have been warm. I think you get extra points for being baptized in December. I think you do. I think that would happen. So now he is being called as a bishop. Now, what's interesting about this is that there hasn't been a bishop. Yeah. So I'm sure Edward is sitting there going, okay, well, I can do this. What do I do? To which Joseph is going to tell him, well, we'll figure it out as we go along. And they do. Yeah, this is brand new. But Edward is an amazing testament of diligence and commitment. He's inspiring. Yeah. Well, it's like Elder Uchtdorf talked about. This is a guy who is on the field. Yep. He is doing. 
From the Institute Manual, we get this summary. Edward Partridge's willingness to leave his merchandise and to spend all his time in the labors of the church is confirmed in the following account. Edward Partridge's daughter later recalled that after this revelation was dictated, her father sold his property and realized but little from the transactions. She added, My father's course in joining the Mormon religion and sacrificing his property caused his friends of the world to think him insane. They could not see what there was in religion to make a man give up all worldly considerations for it. Again, an inspiration. All right, let's take on section 42, sometimes called the law or the laws of the Church of Christ. That's the title that John Whitmer gave it. This is a major revelation about how the church is to be run. Now, this revelation came five days later from section 41 on February 9th, 1831. It's broken into a couple of parts. On February 9th, we got verses 1 through 72, and more came on February 23rd, 1831. That's verses 73 to 93. And so here is the law. Let's start with some background that we get from Saints in Volume 1, Chapter 11. A week later on February 9th, Edward met with Joseph and other elders of the church to pray to receive the law. The elders asked Joseph a series of questions about the law, and the Lord revealed answers through him. Some of these answers repeated familiar truths, affirming the principles of the Ten Commandments and the teachings of Jesus. Others gave the saints new insights into how to keep the commandments and help those who transgress them. Now, we've got some additional information from Revelations in Context. It reads, The church's need for the revelation at this time was acute. When he arrived in Ohio, Joseph found the saints there to be sincere but confused about the biblical teaching that early Christians were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Many of the church's converts in Ohio were members of the family, a communal group that shared the home and farm of Lucy and Isaac Morley in an effort to be true Christians. While their intentions were in keeping with the account Joseph himself had recently received of Enoch's Zion, where the people had achieved the ideal of one heart and one mind, and completely eliminated poverty, the prophet found the Ohio converts following practices that undermined personal agency, stewardship, and accountability, though they were striving to do the will of God so far as they knew it. As a result, the converts were, in the words of Joseph Smith's history, going to destruction very fast as to temporal things, for they considered from reading the scripture that what belonged to a brother belonged to any of the brethren. From Joseph Smith's revelation, we get these insights. This was one of the earliest revelations to be published. It was printed in part by two Ohio newspapers only a few months after its dictation. The earliest extant copies of this revelation suggest that the law may have originally been a compilation of five distinct revelatory commandments, each given in response to a practical question posed by the 12 elders present at the February 9, 1831 meeting. The elders apparently asked questions of Joseph Smith, who then dictated revelatory answers, closing each answer with the words, Even so, Amen. On February 23rd, two weeks after the initial dictation of this text, Joseph Smith and seven elders met to determine how the elders of the Church of Christ are to act upon the points of the law. And Joseph Smith dictated several additional paragraphs of instruction, Analysis of the early manuscripts of the February 9th Revelation and the February 23rd Revelation suggests that the law was a working document meant to be revised or expanded as new circumstances raised new questions. So I wonder if that was kind of their version of the general handbook of instructions at the time. Yeah, good analogy. So before we begin, the Institute Manual has a quote from George Q. Cannon that I really wanted to include. This is President George Q. Cannon from his book, Life of Joseph Smith the Prophet, talking about section 42. He says, quote, Altogether, 
This was a most important revelation. It threw a flood of light upon a great variety of subjects and settled many important questions. Faithful men and women were greatly delighted at being members of a church which the Lord acknowledged as his own and to which he communicated his word through his inspired prophet as he did at this time, end quote. That would have been remarkable. And I say that thinking how new this would have been, how long people may have been waiting for that instruction from heaven. Let's jump in, section 42, verse 1. Hearken, O ye elders of my church, who have assembled yourselves together in my name, even Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the Savior of the world, inasmuch as ye believe on my name and keep my commandments. And again I say unto you, hearken and hear and obey the law, which I shall give unto you. For verily I say, as ye have assembled yourselves together according to the commandment wherewith I commanded you, and are agreed as touching this one thing, and have asked the Father in my name, even so ye shall receive. Very exciting. And so going on in verses 4 through 10, all of the elders in the audience, remember there was 12 who are present, are to preach in regions to the west, two by two, as it says in verse 6. Now in verses 4 and 5, it says, except Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon, they will preach for a little bit, but the Spirit will indicate when they are to stop. And then in verse 10, also, Edward Partridge shall stand in the office whereunto I have appointed him. So, he's still the bishop. In verses 11 through 17, no one is to go forth to preach unless they are ordained by one who has authority. And the leaders of the church know that the ordainer has authority and was properly ordained himself, as it mentions in verse 11. From the Institute Manual, I found a great quote from President Boyd K. Packer from the April 1985 General Conference talking about this very notion of the church being aware that the person sending forth has proper authority. He says, quote, There is purpose in members of the church everywhere in the world being able to identify the general and local authorities. In that way, they can know from whom they learn. There have been too many names presented too many sustaining votes taken, too many ordinations and settings apart performed before too many witnesses, there have been too many records kept, too many certificates prepared, and too many pictures published in too many places for anyone to be deceived as to who holds proper authority, end quote. Nice. The church has really gone out of their way to make sure that we know that that information is available to us. It's important. But going back to the verses, in verse 12, we are told they are to teach the principles of my gospel, which are in the Bible and the Book of Mormon. In verse 13, we're told they are to observe the covenants and church articles to do them. They shall be directed by the Spirit. And there's a great line in verse 14. If ye receive not the Spirit, ye shall not teach. Very important for all kinds of callings. Mm Mm-hmm. They shall speak and prophesy as seemeth the Lord good, in verse 16. The Comforter knoweth all things and beareth record of the Father and of the Son, there in verse 17. Does that sound familiar? When we went over the Book of Mormon, Moroni 10, verse 5, Yeah. by the power of the Holy Ghost you may know the truth of all things. Mm -hmm. From the Institute Manual, then Elder Dallin H. Oaks tells us in an Enzyme article from March 1997, Quote, if we have the Spirit of the Lord to guide us, we can teach any person, no matter how well educated, any place in the world. The Lord knows more than any of us, and if we are his servants acting under his Spirit, he can deliver his message of salvation to each and every soul. President Joseph Fielding Smith taught the Spirit of God speaking to the Spirit of man has power to impart truth with greater effect and understanding than the truth can be imparted by personal contact even with heavenly beings. Through the Holy Ghost, the truth is woven into the very fiber and sinews of the body so that it cannot be forgotten, end quote. That's a great I image. I love that. Yeah, beautiful image. And for those who have served missions... You know that you've experienced this. 
Yeah. And for those who have not served missions, you can look at the Lord's system of sending 18, 19-year-old boys and girls to teach the very learned of the world. And yet they do. Why do they? How is that even possible? Because they are teaching with the Spirit of the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord knows more than they do. It knows a, more than the messenger does. Yeah, it's a miracle. In the seminary manual, they include this quote from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland from an article in The Enzyme, January 2003. He says, The scriptures say, The Spirit shall be given unto you by the prayer of faith. And if you receive not the Spirit, ye shall not teach. This teaches not just that you won't teach or that you can't teach or that it will be pretty shoddy teaching. No, it is stronger than that. It is the imperative form of the verb. Ye shall not teach. Put a thou in there for ye and you have Mount Sinai language. This is a commandment. That is so important. It's the Lord saying, yeah, you're not smart enough to do this on your own. So if you don't have my spirit guiding you, don't do it. Well, and that's so important because this is his work. He right. needs to be at the center of it. That's where power is. Well, power to do, in Elder Oaks's quote, to weave truth into the very fibers and sinews of the body. That's what we're trying to do. That's not something mortals get to do. No, we don't have the capacity. No, no. Verses 18 through 22, we begin to outline commandments. 18 through 19, no killing. Verse 20, no stealing. Verse 21, no lying. 22 through 23, lusting after others. And 24 through 26 on adultery. We're going to talk a little bit about those 22 through 26 commandments. And then it wraps up with, speaking evil of others. So we have kind of a Ten Commandments with a little bit of an expansion on these things. Let's take a look at what it says in verse 18. And now behold, I speak unto the church. This is an important reminder, especially when our eyes are looking out at other people who haven't made the same covenants we have, who don't live maybe the same lifestyle we do. And sometimes we look down on them for that. But the Lord here is speaking to his covenant people. That's the focus of these commandments. He's speaking to you and me right now. Exactly right. So let's take a look at verses 22 through 26 about lust and adultery. In 22, thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart and shalt cleave unto her and none else. I thought we might take a moment to talk about the word cleave. From the Institute Manual, there's a quote from Elder L. Whitney Clayton of the 70, who explained, quote, The happiest marriages I have seen radiate obedience to one of the happiest commandments, that we live together in love. Speaking to husbands, the Lord commanded, Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart, and shalt cleave unto her and none else. A church handbook teaches the word cleave, means to be completely devoted and faithful to someone. Married couples cleave to God and one another by serving and loving each other and by keeping covenants in complete fidelity to one another and to God. Both the husband and wife leave behind their single life and establish their marriage as their first priority. They allow no other person or interest to have greater priority than keeping the covenants they have made with God and each other. Watch and learn. Successful couples love each other with complete devotion. End quote. And I think that's so important because this revelation is given to the leadership of the church. It's given to men. It's speaking to the men. But this absolutely applies to both men and women. It's not one person that's to keep the marriage together. Right. And I loved how it pointed this out because this has been my experience. It's not about completely dedicating yourself to your spouse. It's about both of you completely committing yourself to the marriage. What's best for the marriage? Notice that phrasing. Establish their marriage as their first priority. What helps our marriage? 
most? What behavior encourages the marriage? What choices do we make that makes the marriage most successful? And there's real power in that. I wanted to talk a little bit more about cleave. Elder Clayton explained it well enough, but I wanted to remind you that it's a wise thing sometimes when you come across a word that you're not really sure how to define, to go to a local source of the time. One of the resources that Jay and I used a lot last year when we were studying the Book of Mormon was the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. And I would encourage you to look up the word cleave in the 1828 Webster's because you will find two definitions that actually seem to be contrary to each other. But one of the definitions that I believe is being applied to here is to unite or be united closely in interest or affection, to adhere with strong attachment. It's interesting that the intransitive verb means to unite, but the transitive verb means to divide by force. Think of like a meat cleaver, but it's to unite, unite closely in interest or affection. Although the forces of Satan seek to divide us by force. That's right. Satan seeks to cleave, but in the transitive sense. Yes. So let's look at verse 23. And he that looketh upon a woman to lust after her shall deny the faith, and shall not have the spirit. And if he repents not, he shall be cast out. Let me go back again to Elder L. Whitney Clayton. This is a different talk, October 2007 General Conference found in the Institute Manual, he says, quote, There's a spiritual snare today called pornography, and many, allured by its provocative messages, enter this deadly trap. Like any trap, it is easy to enter, but difficult to escape. Some rationalize that they can casually view pornography without suffering its adverse effects. They say initially, this isn't so bad, or who cares, it won't make any difference, or... I'm just curious, but they are mistaken. The Lord has warned, and he that looketh upon a woman to lust after her shall deny the faith, and shall not have the spirit. And if he repents not, he shall be cast out. Along with losing the spirit, pornography users also lose perspective and proportion. They try to conceal their sin, forgetting that nothing is hidden from the Lord. Real consequences start to accumulate as self-respect ebbs away, sweet relationships sour, marriages wither, and innocent victims begin to pile up. Finding that what they have been viewing no longer satisfies, they experiment with more extreme images. They slowly grow addicted even if they don't know it or they deny it. And their behavior deteriorates as their moral standards disintegrate." End quote very important to remember, a very major problem today. Well, and we need to remember that it's not just a problem for men. That's true. This is a major social issue. It has to do with where our priorities are. The men and women that create this content, the men and women that participate in this content and consume it, it's something that has really shaped our expectations, especially as young people get involved. You know, to Jay's point, there's a moving episode of a show called His Grace. It's part of the Latter-day Saints channel. It's a podcast, a video podcast. There's a young woman that talks about her addiction to pornography. It's an episode called Pornography Addiction, Is There Hope? And that provides that perspective. We often think of that as just a male problem, but it affects both men and women. We'll include a link in the episode. Yeah, anytime we're talking about things like lust, adultery, If your mind first goes to how it's someone else's problem, it's time for some more serious prayerful introspection. All right, let's continue on in verse 24. Thou shalt not commit adultery, and he that committeth adultery and repenteth not shall be cast out. But he that has committed adultery and repents with all his heart and forsaketh it and doeth it no more, thou shalt forgive. But if he doeth it again, he shall not be forgiven but shall be cast out. In the Institute Manual, there's a wonderful quote by Elder David A. Bednar from the April 2013 General Conference. He says, Marriage between a man and a woman is the authorized channel through which premortal spirits enter mortality. 
Complete sexual abstinence before marriage and total fidelity within marriage protect the sanctity of this sacred channel. The power of procreation is spiritually significant. Misuse of this power subverts the purposes of the Father's plan and of our mortal existence. Our Heavenly Father and His beloved Son are creators and have entrusted each of us with a portion of their creative power. Specific guidelines for the proper use of the ability to create life are vital elements in the Father's plan. How we feel about and use that supernal power will determine in large measure our happiness and mortality and our destiny in eternity. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has a single undeviating standard of sexual morality. Intimate relations are proper only between a man and a woman in the marriage relationship prescribed in God's plan. Such relations are not merely a curiosity to be explored, an appetite to be satisfied, or a type of recreation or entertainment to be pursued selfishly. They are not a conquest to be achieved or simply an act to be performed. Rather, they are in mortality one of the ultimate expressions of our divine nature and potential and a way of strengthening emotional and spiritual bonds between husband and wife. That's awesome. Thank you, Elder Bednar. So let's review the commandments given. Verses 18 and 19, no killing. Verse 20, no stealing. Verse 21, no lying. Verse 22 and 23, no lusting after others. 24 through 26, no adultery. And 27, no speaking evil of others. And wrapping up in verse 29, if thou lovest me, thou shalt serve me and keep all my commandments. Does that sound familiar? If you've read the New Testament, maybe John chapter 14, verse 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And to cement this further, let me include a favorite clip from Thomas Tallis, a 16th century composer. I love that. So pretty. And in verse 30, we see, And behold, thou wilt remember the poor and consecrate of thy properties for their support that which thou hast to impart unto them with a covenant and a deed which cannot be broken. Elder D. Todd Christofferson clarifies the notion of consecrating in October 2010 General Conference. He says, quote, To consecrate is to set apart or dedicate something as sacred, devoted to holy purposes, end quote. That's a great image. So the bishop will assign stewardships in verse 31, and anything in excess of your stewardship, in verse 32 it clarifies, as much as is sufficient for himself and his family. So anything more than that should be donated back to the bishop. This is sometimes misunderstood. Uh, Families had private ownership of the property and resources they received, and they were to use their agency to manage their stewardship. As stewards of the Lord's property and resources, they were accountable to him and fully responsible for what he entrusted to them. And we'll find out in later history of the church what that really meant. The early history of the church with the United Order has people who started faithfully in the order, but then left the church. The stewardship that they were given by the church beforehand stayed with them as they left. It was not returned to the church. That stewardship stayed with the person. There are some additional insights later in the Doctrine and Covenants that could help us to understand how the bishop appointed a portion to every family. In Doctrine and Covenants 51, verse 3, it says, Wherefore, let my servant Edward Partridge and those whom he has chosen, in whom I am well pleased, appoint unto this people their portions, every man equal according to his family, according to his circumstances, and his wants and needs. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Needs might be easier to understand, but how do we determine what the wants are? What did the Lord require of people who declared their wants and needs to the bishop? 
For that, let's take a look at Doctrine and Covenants 82, verse 17. And you are to be equal, or in other words, you are to have equal claims on the properties for the benefit of managing the concerns of your stewardships. Every man, according to his wants and his needs, inasmuch as his wants are just. Now, we have the advantage of hindsight here. Let's remember that these verses that Jay gave were given in Revelation later. Edward still had to kind of piece together, okay, well, what does this mean? And he probably started out with his own inspiration and tried to do the best he could. He would get these clarifications later. But the Lord does clarify and does help us in our callings. And he certainly helped the saints here. So the bishop takes these donations and helps the poor and needy, as is mentioned in verse 33. He uses them to purchase lands for the public benefit of the church, in verse 35, to build houses of worship, in verse 35 as well, and building up of the new Jerusalem. So do we have to live that law now? The Institute Manual gives a compelling quote from Elder Bruce R. McConkie from April 1975 General Conference. He says, quote, It is written, He who is not able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory. The law of sacrifice is a celestial law. So is the law of consecration. Thus, to gain that celestial reward, which we so devoutly desire, we must be able to live these two laws. We are not always called upon to live the whole law of consecration and give all of our time, talents, and means to the building up of the Lord's earthly kingdom. But what the scriptural account means is that to gain celestial salvation, we must be able to live these laws to the full if we are called upon to do so. Implicit in this is the reality that we must, in fact, live them to the extent we are called upon so to do. End quote. Great. And let's look for the characteristics a person must have in order to live the law of consecration, starting in verse 40. And again, thou shalt not be proud in thy heart. Let all thy garments be plain, and their beauty the beauty of the work of thine own hands. And let all things be done in cleanliness before me. Thou shalt not be idle, for he that is idle shall not eat the bread nor wear the garments of the laborer. In the Institute Manual, there's a quote from President Gordon B. Hinckley from an Enzyme article in August of 1992. He says, There is no substitute under the heavens for productive labor. It is the process by which dreams become realities. It is the process by which idle visions become dynamic achievements. Most of us are inherently lazy. We would rather play than work. We would rather loaf than work. A little play and a little loafing are good. But it is work that spells the difference in the life of a man or woman. It is stretching our minds and utilizing the skills of our hands that lift us from mediocrity. It is work that provides the food we eat, the clothing we wear, the homes in which we live, We cannot deny the need for work with skilled hands and educated minds if we are to grow and prosper individually and if our nation is to stand tall before the world. When Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, Jehovah declared, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. Something I would add to that is, how much more difficult it is to yield to temptation when we are not idle. I have found in my life, and I have seen throughout my experience, that it's when I am idle that I am most subject to temptations. Stay busy. Get to work. It's the old adage, idle hands are the devil's tools. That's always been true, and in our world, I think, even more so. President Spencer W. Kimball in the October Conference of 1977 said this, Consecration is the giving of one's time, talents, and means to care for those in need, whether spiritually or temporally, and in building the Lord's kingdom. I think that's something I really got this time out of studying these verses. 
is that it's not about what you're getting or what you're giving up. In the same way that we talked about how a marriage is most successful when husband and wife are focused on the success of the marriage, so it's the same in the church. When what we do is not for someone else's success or for our success, but for the building of the Lord's kingdom, what are we doing that's building the Lord's kingdom? It's not about us. So going on in verse 43... Let's see how we can help each other. Verse 43, And whosoever among you are sick and have not faith to be healed, but believe, shall be nourished with all tenderness, with herbs and mild food, and that not by the hand of an enemy. And the elders of the church, two or more, shall be called and shall pray for and lay their hands upon them in my name. And if they die, they shall die unto me, And if they live, they shall live unto me. There's a quote from the April 2010 General Conference from then Elder Dallin H. Oaks, where he says, quote, Latter-day Saints believe in applying the best available scientific knowledge and techniques. We use nutrition, exercise, and other practices to preserve health, and we enlist the help of healing practitioners, such as physicians and surgeons, to restore health. The use of medical science is not at odds with our prayers of faith and our reliance on priesthood blessings. And of course, we don't wait until all other methods are exhausted before we pray in faith or give priesthood blessings for healing. In emergencies, prayers and blessings come first. Most often, we pursue all efforts simultaneously. End quote. Nice. I thought it was interesting in those verses that this is specific instruction for people who are sick but don't have the faith to be healed, Mm. that they are still to be nurtured, you know, still to be tended to. And then in verse 48, and again, it shall come to pass that he that hath faith in me to be healed and is not appointed unto death shall be healed. Well, that's an interesting phrase. The other part of it, the not appointed unto death is an interesting phrase, yes. Yeah. From the Institute Manual, there's a quote from Elder Lance B. Whitman from October 2002 General Conference where he says, quote, All too often we overlook the qualifying phrase, and is not appointed unto death, or we might add, unto sickness or handicap. Please do not despair when fervent prayers have been offered and priesthood blessings performed and your loved one makes no improvement or even passes from mortality? Take comfort in the knowledge that you did everything you could. Such faith, fasting, and blessing could not be in vain. That your child did not recover in spite of all that was done in his behalf can and should be the basis for peace and reassurance to all who love him. The Lord, who inspires the blessings and who hears every earnest prayer, called him home nonetheless. All the experiences of prayer, fasting, and faith may well have been more for our benefit than for his, end quote. It's an interesting perspective. This is particularly meaningful for me. I've mentioned on the show before that I have three children who struggle with autism on varying levels and It's been important for me to understand that in spite of their faith, in spite of my faith, in spite of my wife's faith and our prayers, the Lord has something different in mind for them and for us. And we need to embrace that and accept that. Yeah, all will be made right. Let's go on to verses 49. He who hath faith to see shall see. He who hath faith to hear shall hear. The lame who hath faith to leap shall leap. And they who have not faith to do these things, but believe in me, have power to become my sons. And inasmuch as they break not my laws, thou shalt bear their infirmities. Isn't that interesting? So there's another example of that concept of even if you don't have faith, If your desires are in the right place, if you believe in the Lord, you can become my sons. Well, and it's the job of the church to bear their infirmities, to help them bear their infirmities 
as they break not God's laws. As they are striving, then the church helps to cover the deficit. I don't know if deficit's the right word, but cover the challenge. Help lift up those arms that need lifting up. In 53 through 55, we've got a recapping of the rules that were set forth in verses 30 through 36. In 53, thou shalt stand in the place of thy stewardship. Thou shalt not take thy brother's garment. Thou shalt pay for that which thou shalt receive of thy brother. And if thou obtainest more than that which would be for thy support, thou shalt give it into my storehouse, that all things may be done according to that which I have said. So there's the direct instruction to the earlier group, the family, that just believed that anything belongs to anyone. Right. Not the case. Right. From the Institute Manual, there is an interesting clarification of storehouse. This comes from Guide to the Scriptures. Now, for some of us that grew up with earlier versions of the Scriptures, we're not very familiar with that as we are, say, the Bible Dictionary, Topical Guide, the Index for the Triple Combination. Those were the paper resources we used. But the Guide to the Scriptures is a more recent creation that really brings together all of those features into one thing. It defines selected doctrines, principles, people, places— found in our whole canon of scripture rather than dividing it up like that. And it's a resource that you can find in your gospel library app. Highly recommended to use that as a study resource. So here's what it has to say about the storehouse. That today it's defined as a place where a bishop receives, holds in trust, and dispenses to the poor consecrated offerings of Latter-day Saints. Each storehouse may be as large or as small as circumstances require. Faithful saints donate talents, skills, materials, and financial means to the bishop to take care of the poor in times of need. Therefore, a storehouse may include a list of available services, money, food, or other commodities. The bishop is the agent of the storehouse and distributes goods and services according to need and as directed by the Spirit of the Lord. Wonderful. Going on, verses 56 through 58, these verses refer to the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. The Lord told the saints that Joseph Smith's translation should be taught to all people. In verses 59 through 69, these verses contain instructions from the Lord to Joseph Smith and to other church leaders concerning when and to whom they should preach the gospel. The Lord admonished them to live by the laws that they had been given. And he explained that they would receive further direction that would help them establish the church and prepare the saints to live in the future New Jerusalem. In addition, the Lord taught them principles concerning how they could continue to receive divine revelation. Now, there's an interesting verse, verse 60. It says, And he that doeth according to these things shall be saved, and he that doeth them not shall be damned if he so continue. Now, what's interesting to me about this, sometimes we see verses like this and we tend to think of a very simplistic view of our Heavenly Father. You do what I ask you to and you'll be rewarded. If you don't, you'll be punished. But that's not really what this verse is saying. Take a closer look. He that doeth according to these things shall be saved and he that doeth them not shall be damned if he so continue. To me, these are not the words of a vindictive judge waiting to punish us. This is the explanation of a loving parent. If you do these things, you'll be saved. You'll be successful. You'll progress. If you don't, you won't. But if you turn your course, as long as you don't continue in that direction, then you'll still be saved. I love that. Yeah, the following verses, I think, offer some added testimony to that because... These are lessons in Revelation. God wants to connect with us. Verse 61 says, If thou shalt ask, thou shalt receive revelation upon revelation, knowledge upon knowledge, that thou mayest know the mysteries and peaceable things, that which bringeth joy, that which bringeth life eternal. And jumping ahead to 68, Therefore he that lacketh wisdom, let him ask of me and I will give him liberally and upbraid him 
not. Now, where have we heard that kind of language before? Uh Uh-huh. Maybe James 1.5? It could be. These are words of a loving parent who wants you back and wants the very best for you. In verses 70 through 73, under the law of consecration, those who gave full-time or part-time service in the church were given financial assistance. In verses 74 through 87, the Lord described some laws governing church discipline. He specifically gave direction to priesthood leaders concerning how to minister to those who have committed serious sin, including sexual sins, lying, stealing, or any manner of iniquity. That's right. So any members caught in adultery should be tried before two or more elders and the bishop and every word shall be established. In other words, all testimonies are to be verified. This is in verses 80 through 82. Members should be delivered up to the law of the land if they kill, verse 79, rob, verse 84, steal, verse 85. Now, that might seem odd to you. In some contexts, rob and steal might seem like the same thing. But to rob implies violence or force. The 1828 Webster's defines it as to take away by oppression or by violence. To steal, as the 1828 Webster's tells us, means to take what belongs to another and without his consent. That's a good distinction. Going back, others who should be turned over to the law of the land, if they lie, verse 86, and finally, if they commit any manner of iniquity, in verse 87. So, have you ever felt hurt or offended by someone else's words or actions? What should we do if someone offends us? Verse 88, And if thy brother or sister offend thee, thou shalt take him or her between him or her and thee alone. And if he or she confesses, thou shalt be reconciled. Verses 90 to 93 clarify that offenses given in private should be resolved in private. Offenses given in public should be resolved in public. From the Institute Manual, we get further encouragement and instruction on what to do when we are offended. From Elder David A. Bednar, this is coming from October 2006 General Conference. He says, quote, In some way and at some time, someone in this church will do or say something that could be considered offensive. Such an event will surely happen to each and every one of us, and it certainly will occur more than once. Though people may not intend to injure or offend us, they nonetheless can be inconsiderate and tactless. You and I cannot control the intentions or behavior of other people. However, we do determine how we will act. Please remember that you and I are agents endowed with moral agency, and we can choose not to be offended. Interestingly, the admonition to be ye therefore perfect is immediately preceded by counsel about how we should act in response to wrongdoing and offense. Clearly, the rigorous requirements that lead to the perfecting of the saints include assignments that test and challenge us. If a person says or does something that we consider offensive, our first obligation is to refuse to take offense. And then communicate privately, honestly, and directly with that individual. Such an approach invites inspiration from the Holy Ghost and permits misperceptions to be clarified and true intent to be understood. End quote. Wonderful counsel. What an amazing first obligation. First obligation is to refuse to take offense. That's going to be a hard lesson sometimes. I think offense is so entrenched. At least that's what it feels like right now, that somebody says something and our first thought is that they have a malignant intent and that we have every right to be offended. Good advice. And it kind of goes along with our earlier discussion. You shouldn't take your neighbor's fence because that <laughs> belongs to your neighbor's <laughs> stewardship. Uh, that would be offense. I see. I misunderstood. Uh-huh. Right. I was misperceiving the situation. That's right. But I wasn't offended. And I won't take your fence. Okay, good. Don't take my fence. It's mine. Okay, so what wonderful counsel, you guys. It's so needed. Amen to that. Okay, well, that brings us to section 43. Welcome to 43. 
Yeah. Now, in Joseph Smith's Revelations, it says, Before Joseph Smith's arrival in Kirtland, the converts in the area were left for several months without any experienced leadership. Sidney Rigdon and many of his followers in Ohio had been baptized into the church in November of 1830, and Rigdon then left Ohio to meet Joseph Smith in New York, while Oliver Cowdery and other missionaries who had baptized the Ohio believers left for the western borders of the United States. You'll recall they were headed for a mission to the Lamanites. Concerned about the lack of leadership, Joseph Smith sent John Whitmer to Ohio with copies of the Revelations to comfort and strengthen my brethren in that land. When Whitmer arrived in mid-January, the conduct of the Ohio members surprised and concerned him. He wrote, The enemy of all righteousness had made them think that an angel of God appeared to them and showed them writings on the outside cover of the Bible and on parchment which flew through the air and on the back of their hands, and many such foolish and vain things. Others lost their strength, and some slid on the floor, and such like maneuvers, which proved greatly to the injury of the cause. Whitmer concluded that it was necessary that this people should have instruction and learn to discern between the things of God and the works of Satan. In this atmosphere of religious excess came a specific challenge to Joseph Smith's authority. In February of 1831, the same month that Joseph Smith and other members arrived from New York, a woman, referred to as Mrs. Hubble, claimed to receive revelations which she shared publicly with other members. As John Whitmer explained in his later history, About these days there was a woman by the name of Hubble, who professed to be a prophetess of the Lord, and professed to have many revelations, and knew that the Book of Mormon was true, and that she should become a teacher in the Church of Christ. She appeared very sanctimonious and deceived some who were not able to detect her in her hypocrisy. According to Whitmer, the Lord gave this revelation that the saints might not be deceived. Similarly, the introduction to this revelation in Joseph Smith's history notes that a woman came with great pretensions to revealing commandments, laws, and other curious matters, and that Joseph Smith felt it was necessary to inquire of the Lord. And that he did, starting in verse 1. O hearken, ye elders of my church, and give ear to the words which I shall speak unto you. For behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye have received a commandment for a law unto my church. Now remember when we talked about Doctrine and Covenants section 42 earlier in this lesson? That's the law. Through him whom I have appointed unto you to receive commandments and revelations from my hand. So he's talking about Joseph Smith there. Mm -hmm. Verse 3, And this ye shall know assuredly, that there is none other appointed unto you to receive commandments and revelations until he be taken, if he abide in me. But verily, verily, I say unto you, that none else shall be appointed unto this gift, except it be through him. For if it be taken from him, he shall not have power except to appoint another in his stead. And this shall be a law unto you, that ye receive not the teachings of any that shall come before you as revelations or commandments. And this I give unto you, that you may not be deceived, that you may know they are not of me. Now, didn't we already have this discussion a few lessons back? Yeah. Wasn't this the deal with Doctrine and Covenants section 28? It Iron was. Page? You remember that one? Yep. I guess we needed a refresher. Yeah, well, that's true. From the Institute Manual, I found a quote from President James E. Faust from the April 1996 General Conference, and he summarized five fundamental truths relating to how God reveals truth in his church. He says, quote, first, the keys and the authority of God have been given by him to Joseph Smith and each of his successors who have been called as presidents of the church. Second, those keys and authority are never to be given to another people, and those who have such authority are known to the church. Third, continuing revelation and leadership for the church come through the president of the church, and he will never mislead the saints. Fourth, individual members of the church may receive revelation for their own callings and areas of responsibility and for their own families. 
they may not receive spiritual instruction for those higher in authority. Fifth, those who claim direct revelation from God for the church outside the established order and channel of the priesthood are misguided. This also applies to any who follow them. End quote. Excellent clarity, President Faust. Absolutely. Let's go on with verse 8. Why do we meet together? And now behold, I give unto you a commandment, that when ye are assembled together, ye shall instruct and edify each other, that ye may know how to act and direct by church, how to act upon the points of my law and commandments which I have given. Now, what do we do after we've been instructed? That's verse 9. And thus ye shall become instructed in the law of my church, and be sanctified by that which ye have received. And ye shall bind yourselves to act in all holiness before me. So we will be sanctified by that which we have received, meaning that we are made holy, and we will bind ourselves to act, covenant to act in all holiness. In verses 11 through 14, the Lord told the saints that if they wanted to receive the truths of the gospel, they needed to sustain Joseph Smith in his calling. Verses 15 through 16 contain truths that were revealed to Latter-day Saints who were preparing to serve as missionaries. They are commanded to sanctify yourselves and ye shall be endowed with power, as it says in verse 16. Now, verses 17 through 27, the Lord warns the people to prepare and sanctify themselves for the great day of the Lord. Some of the things that I wanted to pull out there, verse 24, O ye nations of the earth, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but ye would not. Now, we've seen this earlier in the Doctrine and Covenants. This mimics the Lord's admonition to Jerusalem in Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, etc. Yeah, there's many times when the Lord calls and pleads for his people to bless them if they would only come to him. Exactly. And in verse 25, we get a demonstration of all the different voices the Lord uses to call us by the mouth of my servants, by the ministering of angels, by mine own voice, by the voice of thunderings, of lightnings, of tempests, of earthquakes, and great hailstorms, by the voice of famines and pestilences of every kind, by the great sound of a trump, by the voice of judgment, by the voice of mercy all the day long, by the voice of glory and honor and the riches of eternal life, and would have saved you with an everlasting salvation, but ye would not. And I'm so impressed by all the different ways God uses. Some are catastrophic. Some are filled with mercy and pleading and gentleness. He will try everything he can to help us become. And it's ultimately up to us as to whether we will turn to him. Right. That's the thing to remember is that this everlasting salvation, if this is denied us, it's because we rejected it. Yeah. We denied it. Yep. But God will use every tool to help entice and encourage us. So don't do that. Yeah. Choose life instead. Let's choose life. So in verses 28 through 35, look for the great event prophesied in these verses, starting at 28. Wherefore, labor ye, labor ye in my vineyard for the last time. For the last time, call upon the inhabitants of the earth. For in mine own due time will I come upon the earth in judgment, and my people shall be redeemed and shall reign with me on earth. For the great millennium, of which I have spoken by the mouth of my servants, shall come. For Satan shall be bound, and when he is loosed again, he shall only reign for a little season, and then cometh the end of the earth. And he that liveth in righteousness shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye and the earth shall pass away so as by fire, and the wicked shall go into unquenchable fire, and their end no man knoweth on earth, nor ever shall know, until they come before me in judgment. Wow. So now we're talking about events to come, the millennium. Mm -hmm. 
From the Institute Manual, we have a quote from President Gordon B. Hinckley. This is from a Leah Hona article in July 1982 called, We Need Not Fear His Coming. He says, quote, Then will begin the great millennium period of a thousand years when Satan shall be bound and the Lord shall reign over his people. Can you imagine the wonder and the beauty of that era when the adversary shall not have influence? Think of his influence upon you now and reflect on the peace of that time when you will be free from such influence. There will be quiet and goodness where now there is contention and evil, end quote. I love that. Yeah. And then let's wrap up the section. Verse 34, Hearken ye to these words. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Treasure these things up in your hearts and let the solemnities of eternity rest upon your minds. Be sober. Keep all my commandments. Even so, amen. Well, that brings us to section 44. Let's take a look at the background for that. From the Institute Manual, soon after arriving in Kirtland, Ohio, the prophet Joseph Smith received the revelations recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 42, which outlined laws guiding the church. Included was the commandment that the elders should go forth in the power of my spirit, preaching my gospel two by two, and from this place ye shall go forth. The revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants section 44 called for the elders of the church to meet together before going forth to preach the gospel. The prophet Joseph Smith acted on that instruction and sent a letter on February 22, 1831 to Martin Harris, who was still living in New York. The prophet made reference to the revelation when he explained to Martin that the work is here breaking forth on the east, west, north, and south. You will also inform the elders which are there that all of them who can be spared will come here without delay if possible, this by commandment of the Lord, as he has a great work for them all. In subsequent weeks, during the spring of 1831, many of the saints from New York gathered to Kirtland, Ohio. The fourth conference of the church was held in June 1831, and many elders participated in the meetings of this conference, which prepared them to leave afterward to preach the gospel. And there it is in verse 1. Behold, thus saith the Lord unto you, my servants, it is expedient in me that the elders of my church should be called together. Now, we would encourage you, of course, to read the verses yourself, but I was really impressed with how Stephen C. Harper summarized the focus of the revelation in his Book of Mormon Central Commentary. He says, Often, as in section 44, the Lord says something is expedient in me, meaning that the thing is a vital means to accomplish his purposes. The means, in the case of section 44, is to gather all the elders of the church who can possibly attend. At least, that is the first premise of the means, or what is expedient. Here's a paraphrase of the rest of the Lord's rationale in section 44. Gather all the elders. If they are faithful, they will have the Lord's Spirit poured out upon them when they assemble. That will make them powerful preachers of repentance. That will lead many people to convert. That will give the saints power to organize economically in ways that are legal and so not vulnerable to the suits of enemies. That will give the saints power to organize economically in ways that are also legal in terms of the Lord's law of consecration. That all makes more sense when you know that Ohio law demanded that 20 members of a church meet to elect officers and to have their organization recorded by the county clerk in order for the church to have legal recognition and be able to own property. The gathering of the saints in Ohio led prominent and powerful men, including Eber Howe and Grandison Newell, to oppose the church economically in the press and in the courts. Foreseeing the need to organize and the antagonism the saints would experience, 
the Lord revealed section 44. But let's not forget that the Lord keeps his eye on the big picture and the humble. Clearly spelled out in verse 6, Behold, I say unto you that ye must visit the poor and the needy, and administer to their relief, that they may be kept until all things may be done according to my law which ye have received. Amen. Well, there it is, the law. There you have it, the law. The law has been received, and we still have this law, and we need to do our best to study and obey it. Well, and there's so much that helps us to recognize what the principles behind this law is and the expectations that God has given us. It's not about, well, it's not about anything except helping us to become who God wants us to become. That's the purpose. Right. And if we are headed in the wrong direction, we always have the opportunity to turn it around and come back. And we should. I hope you found some things that were inspiring to you this week, things that helped you to maybe see things a different way, maybe with a more eternal perspective. If so, don't lose track of that. If the Spirit has prompted you with anything in your scripture study this week, make a plan of how you will act on it. The Lord will bless and strengthen you to do so. Keep reading your scriptures. We're going to be talking more about the second coming of the Savior in our next lesson. And we'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we're really big fans.